Ricky. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Our next guests, Trudy Seiler and Anna Sophia Robb, are the director and co-star of the new film, Freak Show. It's based on the book by James St. James. The film tells the story of a young man who, while attending a conservative high school, is persecuted for being different. Before we bring our guests out, I'd like to remind our viewers at home that you can submit questions via the submit a question button, right? Right? Right next to the video you're watching. Uh, now, before our guests come out, let's take a quick look at the trailer for Freak Show. You cannot go to your first day of school like that. You're in the red states now. No crickets! No crickets. I've got to prepare you for this world. Be a lamb and make your muff another drinky. You know, son, the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. I am being terrorized out there all day, every day. Aren't you being overly dramatic? Normally, I would take that as a compliment. I just wanted to let you know that I think you're amazing. That didn't startle you. I certainly did not make that sound. You're not supposed to feel. You're supposed to be a man and do. Your situation at school might get a whole lot better. Just tone it down a little. Why did you stop wearing blue jeans? I'm compromising myself for reasons I don't even understand. I mean, you're not getting beamed in the head as much anymore. do with you. I am announcing my candidacy for homecoming queen! How do you want to be identified? Gay, straight, transgender? Gender obliviator? Freak! Well, I was gonna reclaim it as my own anyway. Are you serious? You do what you want, but from now on, you're on your own. We dream away. This is a simple case of decency versus depravity. If life kicks you, you just kick higher! You can call me a freak, okay. You're all freaks, too. Isn't that what being a teenager is all about? You know, ladies and gentlemen, here comes Billy Blue! Oh. Oh. What's the F for? It's for freak, you freak. Head him to the left! Head him to the left! Everybody, please welcome Anna Sophia Robb and director Trudy Styler. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here. Uh, Thanks Trudy, for having us. You've, you've produced a number of movies at this point. You've directed a, a short narrative and you've directed a documentary. What made Freak Show the first film that you sort of stepped behind the camera as a director for a feature length film? Well, this is sort of like a wonderful, uh, fateful moment, maybe, because. Um, we were working Maven Pictures and Flower Films, which is Drew Barrymore's um, um, production company, were working on the film together. So we were producers, and we had a director in place. And uh, at the 11th hour, our director had, a, um, a, had to excuse himself on personal reasons. And so we were left with, what do we do? This is July 2015. We want to be in production by the end of September. And so I asked my producer colleagues, how would they feel if I stepped into the director's chair? And they said, go for it if you think you can do it. And uh, so what did that mean? It meant uh, uh, triggering the finance, which uh, w happened courtesy of wonderful Bette Midler, who uh, after she resisted reading Freak Show, because she didn't, really didn't want to do a movie at that point, um, when she did read it, she called and said, I'm in. And uh, from that moment, uh, we just like sped forward to go into production, pre-production for four weeks uh, in September, beginning uh, shooting, beginning of October, 22 day shoot and uh, finishing the night before Thanksgiving. <laughs> so what was it like for you jumping into the director's seat? I mean, that's all the, the way that you got yourself into the director's seat, but now what happens once you're there and, and you're in it? Have you been producing so long and sort of really see how it's done that it didn't feel much different or did it feel uh, very different? It, it's too, I can't remember how it felt in all honesty. I think you were just that, sprinting. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I mean, before um, Celine and myself, Celine Rattray and myself had Maven Pictures, I had my own production company in England called Shingu Films. And um, 
Uh, I produce my my niche, if you like, was to produce um, first time writer directors. So Those of you don't know, she produced Lock or Snatch and and Lockstock. Is, Lockstock was first. Lo do I, I got that, but I wasn't. But I said just saw Snatch. But yeah, Lockstock as well. Yeah, Lockstock yeah. Uh, uh, and with Guy and Snatch, and then um, Moon with Duncan Jones. Uh, um, most recently, American Honey, you you worked on as well, which is one of my. I think maybe my favorite films of all time. I love that movie. Oh, that's a lovely thing to hear. Thank you very much. Um, we love it too. So, uh, but being Andrea Arnold certainly isn't a first timer. But the my my um, British life as a producer were first timers, and I think because of first timers, you you do um, a lot of hand holding. What do I mean by that? Just sort of like being around your director and reassuring and giving them sort of like all, all that they need. And in doing so, I, I think I learned a, a lot at that time about their their different visual styles and. Um, you know, being in the edit room with them, what did that mean to, like, really, how is the story coming together? So uh, so I think that was a big learning curve for me. So when I jumped into this role, I really didn't have time to examine, you know, what films must I watch to be able to make Freak Show. There was literally no time at all just to tell the story, surround myself with the best that uh, the technicians that I could possibly... You have on, on this film, right? <laughs> yes. I mean, uh, is it Dante Spinetti? Is that the name of the... the Dante the, Spinotti. Spinotti, excuse yeah. me, the director of photography, and this is the yeah. guy that shot Heat, like worked from with LA Michael Mann for years. It's crazy. It, yeah. yeah. Well, Dante and I worked together in 1987 when I was working as an actress, uh, and we d I was doing a film in Cinecita, and uh, Mr. Fellini f was still alive, and it was a, like an amazing time in my life. And uh, I was working with um, Dante, who's the cinematographer, and I had a lot of time with him because there was just me in the movie, an actor who shot for three days called Greg Henry, you may know, and uh, apart from that, a deadly mamba snake. And so uh, I didn't really have many friends that to talk to, so it had to be the crew. And uh, so I found myself in a conversation with him in 1987 that went like this, Dante, um, do you like being a DP? And he said, yes, yes, I will go to America. And I said, okay, great. And he said, and what about you? W would you always be an actor? And I said, well, maybe one day, you know, when, um, when uh, you know, I'm, I'm older, I'll be a director. And he said, I will be at your side when you're a director, call me. So cut to 2015. The phone rings, Dante says, si, sí, pronto. And I say, well, uh, you know, in 1987, you said you'd be at my side if ever I was a director. That day has come. And uh, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. What, was he surprised? Was he taken aback? Or was he a little like, oh, I did make that bet? <laughs> <laughs> well, he's, he's, he's become a friend since my, I did that Italian film, so I do know him, but I also know how busy he is. So I think that it was really, just really like an amazing fluke that he happened to be free and that he did say yes. So he was like my great collaborator on this. Yeah. Now, you know, I, I, I want to get to talking about what Freak Show is about, but I just want to, one more question about how the story of you getting into the director's chair and how it feels for you a, a, after. I'm curious, now that you've finished, and as you said, it was kind of a sprint and it felt as though you were kind of there to really to tell the story and not to sort of think too hard about what it means for you to be a director at this point. Do you want to continue directing or was it kind of like you had to direct that project because of what happened and you'll just kind of maintain producing? No, I, I, I was just, just telling Anna Sophia in the dressing room that, um, that uh, my biggest fear uh, was um, in casting Billy, and I, I knew... He's wonderful. Uh, yes, he is. Alex Lothar is, is wonderful. Um, but I thought, if I, if I don't get this right, I, there isn't a movie, because it's such a huge role. And I needed a an actor of you know, great dimension who has you know vulnerability, who has strength, who has like native wit and intelligence. And... Um, and when I was working as a producer with our other director, we saw about 85 young male actors for the role. And um, I, I hadn't really sort of like thought this was ever gonna be my gig. Um, and I liked a lot of them, but when it became my, uh, my opportunity, that's what kept me awake at night. What if I get this wrong? There is no film. And um, 
I went to England and I asked A.B. Kaufman, our um, casting director, could you send some British actors along? And Alex came in one Sunday morning, he was in rehearsals for a play, and we auditioned, I auditioned him. And th at that point I had this sense of peace. I slept well every night, even when we were shooting, knowing that I'd got Alex in the central role who I knew could do this role. Well, he gets so much right. He never goes overboard. And my favorite example of that in the film that I was really taken aback by, because most young actors, I think, would have, or any actor really would have handled it differently, is the moment where uh, his friend essentially shuns him because of how, his, how he's starting to make him look around the high school. And he pushes him away, and he calls him a, you know, a, a slur for, for, for gay people. And the way that Alex handles that is not to cry or put his head down, but his character has been so confident throughout the entire movie, it's still handled with a sort of a brush of confidence. It was such a smart, articulate way to handle that. Yeah, moment. well, you see him stuffing his emotion yeah. back, but not like reacting to it. Yes, he, he's, his armor is that he's going to retain his dignity. Isn't I think most people, even with that knowledge of the character, would still want to react and push, push something in front of the camera. Yeah. Very, it was just a very, I was very taken aback by his decision in, in that scene. Anna, what drew you to, to Freak Show and, and working with Trudy and being a part of this whole, this whole movie? I um, I remember when I when I read the script. I first I thought freak show. I was like, that's a great title, <laughs> and um, and I w when I read the script, I found myself um, laughing on almost every page because there's such a great voiceover. James coming from James St. James, and his voice. And then I also I, I felt like what um, this is a story that needs to be told because I think there are a lot of young people who who feel this way and they feel completely suppressed and unseen and not able to be themselves. And I think it's, um, it's a triumphant story about letting your freak flag f fly. And so I, I love the message of it and it sat well. I and mean, I also felt like I can really stand up for this film. And then I also thought, I don't think there's ever a character in history called blah, blah, blah. That's my character's name. And I thought, this is just going to be great fun. It's like, I, it's this quirky character. There's quirky characters throughout the film, but there is a groundedness to it, I think. that um, and, and Trudy, I, I remember when I was reading it and when we met the first time because I was trying to figure out the tone of like, okay, comedy, um, dramedy, um, coming of age story, uh, coming out story, what, what is this? And I think speaking with Trudy helped me under, understand and when we were on set that it's just like real life where you're talking with your friends and you can uh, be completely raucous but then also um, have a, an intense conversation and then laugh afterwards and it kind of can ping pong around. Um, and I like that emotional reaction to the story and being on set that we were able to be more flexible with it. You have a, a wonderful monologue in the in the film about this thing called the shadow people. Yeah. And I'm wondering if if you ever if you ever feel like a shadow person as well, and if that had any sort of if you related to that monologue. I know nothing about you. That's not like an <laughs> assumption or an observation of anything. No, kind. A, I don't. I don't. I think it's a compliment. Um, yeah. There's this great bit in the film um, when it, it, it's towards it's towards the end and and um, blah, 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 reveals that there are these shadow people in the school who are willing to stand up for Billy and they're people who are, who are just never seen and you never notice them. And I remember reading it and went, yeah, that's true. There's always in the high school yearbook, you look at pictures and you go, wait, I never, never noticed that person before. And I think for me, sometimes it can be a choice to be a shadow person. Sometimes it's safer because um, you don't want to put yourself out there to be seen, to be judged. And I think Billy really stands up um, and he isn't apologetic about who he is and he acknowledges that there are those, those people who are afraid to step forward and he gives them a voice. Or even if you're not that type of person, he, he can be a leader for them um, and sort of a conduit for who they are in high school or who they don't want to be, I don't know. <laughs> How did you go about assembling the rest of the cast? There's such an amazing cast outside of just the kids in it. I mean, you have Abigail Breslin and Laverne Cox, but then in the house you have Celia Weston, who's just one of the best. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that it's a formidable cast, and I, I, I really owe them a huge debt of gratitude. Um, so, um, being, I'm, 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 
I, I've trained as an actor. I trained in, um, in England as an actor, and I made a living as an actor for many years before I became a producer. I still act. I've just actually been in a television series for Netflix that, uh, that will go out. So I, I keep my acting um, hat on, um, and I love actors. And I think my joy of... Of, of working on Freak Show was really working, working with the actors. So I've got, um, I like to think, great taste in actors. And uh, I love Cecilia Weston as well. I've seen many uh, of, um, of her films, and she's a formidable theatre actress. And Larry Pine, I think, has so much sort of like held in um, dignity. He's a majestic looking man at the same time. I think that he was like a really good pick to be. Um, to be Alex's father. I think that people have said to me, wow, they even look alike, and they do. And um, So I, I enjoyed that process of casting alongside, you know, A.V. Kaufman, who is such a, you know, seasoned um, casting director, that that was like one of the most pleasurable um, uh, experiences I had, and, um, and especially when they said yes, you know. No, I, I, I'm not sure, but I think uh, James St. James's book was probably written pre-2016, right? But yeah. there is a Make America Great Again reference uh, <laughs> in the film. Uh, what made you want to drop that? Well, you have to remember this. We started this film in 2015. So Donald Trump was not even the Republican candidate. He was on the campaign trail to become the Republican candidate. And then... You know, going down the escalator, essentially. It, yeah. Yeah. When then we would hear this inane mantra, "Make America Great Again." Well, what you know? What are your policies? What does it mean? So, it was. It became sort of like a worm in your ear, you know. And uh, P.J. Clifton and Beth Rigazio, who are writers, said, "Should should we use that line?" And it's like, well, it belongs to Lynette, um, mean girl, who is. Uh, Bible thumping fundamentalist who really, you know, homophobic uh, person who really is so treats Billy so meanly, um, and uh, so so in that scene that um, that Abigail does so ferociously well, pitted against the wonderful Laverne Cox playing the journalist, they sort of like they, you know, go head to head and, uh, and make America great again comes up. And it used to be sort of like greeted with uh, a laugh during the like the early days of um, Trump sort of like running. But once, once he became president, it's no longer, nobody laughs anymore. They go like, Oh, you can feel it sort of in the pit of most people's bellies. Like you get very angry at the character in that moment. Whereas, like you said, yeah, and if he hadn't become president, we all called oh, silly, yeah. silly little girl. Thanks, this is, yeah. yeah, right. But now we're like, oh shit, she, she was right. <laughs> <laughs> he won. Um, I'm, I'm curious. Going back to you, directing versus producing. Did even though you had been working on this film beforehand as a producer, when you stepped into the director's chair, did your emotions about the story, having to tell the story as a director, did that change how you related to the material at all, or change how you did it feel closer to you at that point? Well, inevitably, you know, and I think that being a director and being an actor, I think it's the same side of the brain. Being a producer is a very different side of the brain, you know. Um, so, how so? Oh well, I, I think. Producing is more left brain, so you you know you you are required to think budget, time, you know log logistics, um, all the things I'm really bad at, and Celine Rattray is really good at. <laughs> and um, the right brain is because a creative brain, so um, you know the absorption of you know all the uh, the emotions that you've had in your personal life. So so you know you you have a public persona and a private persona. You know we learn that in. In, in acting schools. Um, and I think for me, uh, what was my um, private persona with the, uh, with the storyline? Well, I was, I was bullied at school. Um, so I have a, a, like a direct like, lifeline to what is that? How does that feel? Um, I was hit by a truck when I was three. I was damaged with my face was very scarred and those corridors of schools became the sort of like the walks of shame for me I would be you know catcalled and scarface those like you know I had 
a group of mean girls who would like chant Scarface, Scarface. And uh, so when I came to do Freak Show, those corridors that uh, we use so much, they're almost like a character. They're, you know, they're, they're full of predatory eyes, like eyes that, are, that Billy has to watch out for himself. And then as the bullying increases, we see he tries to protect himself with his apparel. And uh, that's not going to work either, because when you're marked, you're marked. So I, I th think I brought a lot of my my personal experiences to the the, um, the the theme of bullying in the in the in the movie I think what's so inspiring about Billy as a character is as much as he's bullied and made fun of he refuses to be a victim of any kind that's right he's a uh, he's indomitable and that um, even when he's beaten up and coming around from his horrible experience in in hospital the first thing he asks for is for the doctor to please get him some lip gloss and you can see oh yeah he's not a victim he's never going to be um he's never going to be put down um and uh, and i i think that what sort of like makes him rise up is that experience is well um i'm i'm not i'm go i'm still Whatever they do, they can beat me, they can bully me, but I am going to remain true to who I am. And I think that's the crux of the story. Um, and it's certainly true of my story, was, you know, that my bullies didn't get the best of me either. Um, yeah, what are they doing now? They're not directing movies. <laughs> not. Exactly. They might, they, they might be, but I haven't heard of them yet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I haven't heard of them. Uh, I, you know, I'm curious, uh, before we turn to audience questions, we just saw in the trailer, and he is in the a film for a brief amount of time, John McEnroe. How did, I mean, it's a perfect casting for John McEnroe. How did you get him in the film? Well, I've known John McEnroe for about 30 years of, uh, of my life. He's, uh, he's our neighbor in... Uh, we live sometimes in LA and sometimes New York, and he's he's actually our neighbor in both cities, so he can't get away from me. And when I've got a, I'm very tenacious, so when I have an idea, and I was thinking, you know, um, somebody with who's kind of like kind of volatile, a, um, a, a, a sports teacher, volatile, does a lot of shouting. Uh, John McEnroe, <laughs> and so does McEnroe shout in his personal life? Can you hear him through the walls, like yelling at? The TV or something? Yeah, when I first <laughs> when I first met John, um, I was um, I was in um, in on the West Coast, and uh, my son was uh, eleven or twelve at the time, and there was a game of basketball outside, and uh, uh, my son asked if he could join in the game, and and I kind of looked up and down and said, "Sure, you know." Sure. So, so he joined in, and and then I heard this this yelling, and I came out of my house, and he was sort of like he he sort of like has this sort of huge volume at, uh, when he's when he's coaching kids. So I always remembered that that he was like yelling at these eleven year olds, and sort of came out to see well, what was this guy doing, um, and uh, so I I remembered that and said you know. You could play Coach Carter. I actually, uh, I, I called his agent and I said, you know, can uh, could would John be in this movie? And he said, uh, you what, do you want him to be himself? And I said, oh, almost. <laughs> uh, let's get some questions from the audience. Who has a question? Right here. Hi, ladies. Um, so, Anna Sophia, compared to Trudy, you're just beginning, and Trudy, you've spent last 30 years establishing yourself as an actress and a director and a producer. Um, my question is, when you do have to give up your precious time of your personal life and so forth to dedicate yourself to the projects. Which projects for both of you have made it really worthwhile to be completely involved in it and perhaps miss out on the more fun stuff or family time and so forth? Can we go first? Um, well, I, yeah, that's, I've been acting since I was nine. So I've been doing this for like, oh my, 14 years now. It's a long time and, but, m I was always, I'm graduating from NYU in, in May, and so it's always been a sort of where school has been a priority for me. Um, but it's a great, it, it's a great litmus test. Um, and I shot Freak Show while I was in class, actually. And luckily, with my class schedule, I only missed a few. Um, but I think, for me, most of the projects, I mean, every single project I've done, I've learned from. But I'd say, starting out, um, as a young person and, and putting my education first, um, that will continue as I 
make films and I want to produce and I want to direct in the future. Um, but um, I think just thinking about like with this project, what what is my moral ground and what messages is it sending? And I think that's definitely worth, um, well, that is our life. I feel like we're artists. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I'm always being told that I've got way too much on my plate and I've said yes to so many things and uh, that I should really learn the word no. Um, it's like when I look at my emails in the morning, instead of going to the first one that you see, I sort of plunge into the middle and I go down and then I go up and I get into a complete mess. I think that I, I have um, uh, ADHD, I know I have ADHD, uh, but so, um, so I'm, and I think having ADHD, um, as I say, is not a, it's not a deficit. I think that it's a, I think it's a plus for the job that I do because I'm a formidable multitasker. And as a multitasker, the downside of that is that you do say yes to too many things. Um, so I like to think that all that every day is filled with wonderment with me. I feel that that this is a very privileged um, job that I'm in as a producer, now a director, and I'm passionate about it, and I'm passionate about it most of all because when we set out uh, our store for Maven Pictures is that I really felt that the entertainment industry is devoid of um, women's voices. And so um, there are the, the day can be as long as it need be, and I never seem to run out of steam because I really am into trying to move the needle to give women in film much many more opportunities. There are twenty five percent of us only as producers. There is five percent of only only women workers, directors. Uh, add to that the narratives of the entertainment industry, which become the narratives of the world. American movies are seen by most of the world. Are, they are mainly male narratives, and that women in films are often in a relationship to the protagonist of the movie. In other words, if you were to, to put the, the woman into the protagonist with the male protagonist role, you'd still have a great film. And so, uh, so for me, that really keeps me awake, invigorates me, and uh, pushes me forward. So um, that's what I, I'm like, I feel privileged to do and that, um, that I, I, I want to keep doing. And I want to encourage you to produce and direct because I know you'd be formidable. Do you, um, yeah, let's get a round of applause for that. Do you take inspiration of uh, what we saw on Monday? Was it Monday night or Sunday night at the Golden at the Golden Globes with uh, activists on the red carpet and the solidarity amongst actresses? Well, I, I've only heard about it, and I've seen. I, I watched um, Oprah's speech um, as I was traveling back uh, from uh, Jamaica that night. Um, I mean, it's good. To, it's great to see that women are, are really taking the lead in the, in 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 this area of refusing to be bullied and refusing abuse. But also, I think we have to take it forward and to say, look, we have to talk about equal pay. We have to talk about equal opportunity. We have to talk about equal equaling narrative in films and who the protagonists are. They don't have to be men, so we need more screenwriters that are women. I think that being very proactive to how, how do we go forward now? So I'm, I'm, very, I'm very excited about that. Fantastic. Next question. Uh, Trudy, why did you d decide and why did you want to make this movie? And uh, also, what were the major challenges of working on it? Um, well, I, 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 I fell into being the director, as, as I've said. The major challenges were time and money. Uh, we had a very short prep, uh, a month, and 22-day shoot. And it, I mean, to, to make a 90-minute film in 22 days is really sort of eye-wateringly a uh, short amount of time. Um, so those were the challenges. Um, and, you know, all, and in a, 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 a very small budget picture, you're always having to compromise. And we had to lose a few scenes, which I was sort of sad about. But to still keep the, sort of the story and the richness of the story. And, and I think because we got the caliber of, of actors that we did, this, 
uh, fine act, um, performance from you, Anna Sophia, and and Alex, and, uh, and and the team that we got such concentrated performances from them that I think that it didn't matter that the scenes that went that sort of told a bit of exposition perhaps they could go because I think that the emotional intelligence of our actors really spoke many more volumes and losing some scenes was not so difficult. Absolutely. I think it's time for one more question. Where is it? Hi there. So um, I'm really interested in filmmaking and just for both of you, um, like what advice do you have for people who are aspiring like actors and filmmakers? Well, um, I would just get started. I think um, now is a, is a great time to, um, if you have a friends and you want to just do, like start with uh, just reading plays out loud together and get involved in your local theater or, I mean, you're in New York, so go see as much as you can. And I think, I think just watching films and continuing to um, s stimulate your imagination and, um, and I think I love filmmaking and I love the theater and it's exciting when it comes out, but it's just as important on a smaller scale or for your friends or for your school or for whatever, just because it's about the story. And I think continuing to go back to like, what, is, what are the stories that I want to tell and share or what stories aren't being heard is, that continues to fuel me and hopefully it will for you. Are you planning on being an actor or a producer? You're planning on being a director. Yeah. <laughs> um, so my advice would be to um, to do a lot of people watching. Get on the subway, and I mean, we're usually traveling somewhere, right? When we, we're on the subway, that's the point. But the, the point for you, I would suggest, is to really sort of like imbibe the people that you see around you. Like look at the scenes that are going on like in everyday life. And I think that, the, you know, richness of film is sometimes in the in-between moments of life as it's what we're we're telling stories of life normally and so put yourself in a situation where you're amongst people and observing them very very carefully and remember the those the, as you walk down, down the streets of new york you sort of like hear fantastic snippets of conversation and i sometimes like long in movies to like have the chitter chatter of the kind of like these kind of great conversations that you only your ear will only get like a few words of and then you'll hear someone like screaming and you know the honking of the of, of taxis but it's a very you know this is it's it's very rich for your uh for, for your learning and then make notes of it. And if you can, maybe some recordings too. And just keep that and build up your portfolio of, of uh, exciting things. And, and notice yourself, what then about all that is, what is it saying to you in your, in your personal life? And always bring you to the, to the forefront. I found that very useful in this fun time experience. Uh, I love the film. Congratulations. Freak Show. How can people see Freak Show? When can they see it? So um, it opens at the IFC downtown this weekend and uh, on, uh, on VOD platforms on Friday. Fantastic. Everybody give them a round of applause for Freak Show. Thank you.